You're a wonderful sight and the very best young men and young women in the whole world. You have the restored gospel of Jesus Christ to guide your footsteps of faith in today's ever increasingly wicked world. Who is most important to you in your life? Many Latter-day Saints would say their spouse, their children, or their parents. Whoever you named is your real God. If you named anyone other than the God of the Bible, Jesus says you are an idolater. No matter how many nice things you may say about him or how religious you may be, your church tells you that families are forever, and Jesus is the means of bringing that about. The real Jesus' message is far more radical. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Do you recognize that these are not the same Gospels? The Apostle Paul told the Galatians, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. The Galatians were religious and called themselves Christians, but the Apostle Paul warns them that they were in fact abandoning the true gospel for a false one. He calls down the curse of God on anyone who would teach a gospel contrary to the one he preached. The false gospel of which he warned was that Jesus helps good people exalt themselves. The Galatians weren't denying their need for Jesus, but they believed they had to make themselves worthy of him through their personal righteousness. Does this sound familiar? The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints affirms as its third article of faith, we believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. What will you resolve to be? If I can read your thoughts correctly, you are committed to strive for personal righteousness. That's a wonderful goal. But it's a little more difficult to measure than a goal to shed 10 pounds of unwanted weight or to run or swim a measured distance. Come with me to the high mountain and I'll suggest some ways in which you can measure your progress toward personal righteousness. This is the doctrine of personal worthiness that runs through your scriptures. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved, after all we can do. If ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is His grace sufficient for you. Your prophets and apostles have told you that they received from an angel what they called a restored gospel. It is about Elohim proving His worthiness for celestial exaltation like countless gods before Him, and you doing the same. It begins with a God who is not so holy, proceeds to a view of sin that is not so awful, and centers around your tithing, the word of wisdom and temples. In all these you prove your worthiness. It is a gospel in which Paul's teaching is constantly dismissed. This is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a new twist on the Galatian heresy. 
The Gentile Galatians thought they could prove their worthiness by being circumcised and keeping the ceremonial laws of the Jews. The Apostle Paul told them that in seeking to add to what Christ had done, they were actually denying the gospel entirely. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. Do you hear the seriousness of the matter? This false gospel was no gospel at all. The Apostle Paul tells them, Christ shall profit you nothing. In other words, you will stand before a holy God in only the filthy rags of your own righteousness and be condemned to outer darkness. It was not that circumcision in itself was wrong, but to do it as a matter of personal righteousness was to deny the true value of what Christ did. It was to imply that the value of Christ's death on the cross was inadequate, and we can somehow add what he could not. What the Galatians were only doing by implication, your prophets have done explicitly. It is true that the blood of the Son of God was shed for sins through the fall and those committed by men. Yet men can commit sins which it can never remit. There are sins that can be atoned for by an offering upon an altar, as in ancient days. And there are sins that the blood of a lamb, or a calf, or a turtle dove cannot remit, but they must be atoned for by the blood of the man. Do you understand what Brigham Young is saying? The blood of animals can take away some sins. The blood of Christ can take away others. But for the worst sins... Christ's blood is simply not worth enough. Only a man's own blood is sufficient. Over and over, your prophets have denied the all-sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice. To really understand that sacrifice, we have to go back to the promise God made Adam. Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, Thou shalt surely die. Sin demands death, so there was death that day. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. God stripped Adam and Eve of the fig leaves you so much treasure and clothed them in the skins of dead animals. Like Abel's sacrifice in Genesis 4, these animals were the substitutes for the wrath of God. In the Passover, it was the blood of the Lamb that turned away God's angel of death. It was not that shedding the blood of these animals could truly take away sin, but they were types and shadows that pointed forward to the sacrifice of Jesus which could. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. We see a picture of the gospel when God calls on Abraham. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. As confused as he was, Abraham trusted God and took Isaac to the mountain. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, my father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. God provided a ram in the place of Isaac that day. But the real promise was that God would ultimately do what he had asked Abraham to do. He offered his son as a sacrifice for sin. The good news of the gospel is that God has provided himself a lamb. That substitute is not our elder spirit brother, but our creator and our God. The one before whom the holy angels had to cover their faces is the one who hung naked on that cross for sinners. Do you understand how presumptuous it is to think that there is something lacking in his sacrifice to which we can add? 
The LDS Church exalts in our worthiness because they have tried to rob Jesus of his unique glory. Like the Galatians, they have kept the language of Christ's atonement while ripping out the substance of it. The biblical gospel is about the great exchange. Jesus takes our sins upon himself so that we might receive his righteous life counted to us. The righteous suffers for the unrighteous, the worthy for the unworthy, the just for the unjust. In his crucifixion, Jesus nails our rebellious heart, our filthy past, and our poisonous life to the cross. In his resurrection, he gives us his heart, a new heart that loves him. His perfect righteousness is counted to us as our sins were counted to him, and he puts his Holy Spirit in us. The gospel is not a plan of salvation, but new birth in Jesus Christ. The true gospel is not about our worthiness, but about the worthiness of Jesus. The Apostle Paul tells us, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting, then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The idea that we are forgiven and accepted by the free mercy of God, by grace alone, through simple faith in Jesus, without our works, is heretical to your leaders. The second greatest heresy in all eternity is the doctrine that de denies the divine sonship, that sets up a system of salvation that says you can give lip service to the name of Christ, but you're saved by grace alone, without efforts and without work on your part. If Paul taught salvation by grace alone or faith alone, that would be a major cleavage from Joseph Smith, but it is not. What could be better proof of apostasy than the change of the Christian religion from a religion of action to a religion of belief alone? The Apostle Paul made clear that we are saved by works, but they are Christ's works, not our own. In Romans 4, the Apostle Paul says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. As he had done with John's Gospel, Joseph Smith turned this passage on its head in his supposedly inspired translation. But to him that seeketh not to be justified by the law of works, but believeth on him who justifieth not the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Here is the question. Does God justify the ungodly through simply turning to Jesus in faith? The Bible says yes because we are all ungodly. Joseph Smith says no. Smith tells you that you need the word of wisdom, temples, and church service. The grace of God is only sufficient after you have done all you can do. Smith's view of grace makes sense if God is an exalted man. Because God is not that holy, sin is not that bad, so biblical grace makes no sense. The problem is that the real God is not an exalted man. He is the infinite, eternal, holy God who hates sin. We cannot buy him off with anything we can do, and our sins are the highest treason we can commit. When we refuse to hear him, we are shaking our fist to heaven and saying that we will not have him to rule over us. We are implicitly saying that God needs to shut up and be happy with what we are willing to give. 
God shows us in the Bible the reality that we are all guilty rebels, and biblical grace is our only hope. Hear the words of Jesus. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Do you hear what the Pharisee was saying? He was thankful to God for making him such a good person. And he was boasting in what he was doing. The publican was a tax collector for the Roman Empire. As a notorious sinner, he knew he had nothing good to offer. He confessed his sinfulness and cried out for mercy. Jesus said he, and not the Pharisee, was right with God. Everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Come on, ye persecutors, ye false swearers, all hell boil over. Ye burning mountains, roll down your lava, for I will come out on the top at last. I have more to boast of than ever any man had. I am the only man that has ever been able to keep a whole church together since the days of Adam. A large majority of the whole have stood by me. Neither Paul, John, Peter, nor Jesus ever did it. I boast that no man ever did such a work as I. In refusing to hear the Bible, Latter-day Saints are repeating the sin of Adam and Eve, substituting their own judgment for the explicit revelation of God. Jesus offers us the free gift of a righteousness without spot or blemish if we will simply cry out to Him in faith. In seeking to add your worthiness to the worthiness of Christ, you are in fact refusing to admit your real problems and denying the glory of Jesus. It's the same basic sin of which Paul accuses the unbelieving Jews. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Rather than recognizing the holiness of God, the seriousness of sin, and their own unworthiness, the unbelieving Jews sought to establish their own righteousness. They refused to recognize that their righteousnesses were as filthy rags. This is why Jesus told the Pharisees that the harlots and publicans would enter the kingdom before them. These notorious sinners saw their need and repented, but the supposedly moral Pharisees refused to see their need for Jesus. Like your prophets have told you to do, they sought to establish their own worthiness. Perfection is a long, hard journey with many pitfalls. It's not attainable overnight. Eternal vigilance is the price of victory. Eternal vigilance is required in the subduing of enemies and the becoming, becoming the master of one's self cannot be accomplished in little spurts and disconnected efforts. There must be constant and valiant, purposeful living, righteous living. The glory of the Lord can be had only through this correct and worthy marriage and living the clean, worthy life. In Psalms, the 22nd chapter, we read, But I am a worm. And no man, reproach of men, and despised of the people. This is diametrically opposed to our philosophy. Certainly one is not likely to rise high who has that kind of an opinion of himself. Man can transform himself, 
and he must. Man has in himself the seeds of godhood which can germinate and grow and develop. Like the acorn becomes the oak, the mortal man becomes a god. It is within his power to lift himself by his very bootstraps from the plane on which he finds himself to the plane on which he should be. It may be a long, hard lift but with many obstacles, but it is a real possibility. The biblical gospel is not about lifting ourselves by our bootstraps. It is about a new heart and a new birth. Remember the warning of Paul to the Galatians. Righteousness was either all of Christ or all of them. If they tried to keep some of the law for righteousness, they were bound to keep all of it. As sinners, that law could never justify them, but only condemn. They had fallen from grace, and Christ would profit them nothing. Like the Galatians, you have given token deference to Christ's righteousness, but you are seeking to make up for what you think is lacking. Hear how the Apostle Paul describes his worthiness. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gain to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. When many Latter-day Saints hear of salvation by grace alone, they roll their eyes. The only alternative your church can imagine to the legalism of personal worthiness is an easy believism where people walk an aisle, pray a prayer, and live like pagans. This is a false gospel, against which your general authorities rightly appeal to the Apostle James. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works, Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. The irony is that your church that so quickly points you to the Apostle James points you away from the Apostle Paul. They claim that James contradicts what Paul said in Ephesians 2, but they ignore the totality of what Paul said. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Both Paul and James are teaching that works flow from this new birth, yet neither is claiming that it is the basis of that new birth. Paul is telling those who are trying to establish their own righteousness that we have none. The law requires perfect obedience. Even if we obeyed in everything, it would only be what we owed. The only way that Jesus can save any of us is in our sins. 
James is dealing with easy believism where people claim to have faith but have no works. He is saying this so-called faith is dead. The Holy Spirit who gives us faith lives in true believers and produces good works. He saves us not only in our sins, but from them as well. Legalism and easy believism are two sides of the same coin. Both deny the new birth. Legalism denies its necessity, and easy believism denies its effect. Imagine a dead apple tree, devoid of all signs of life. Easy believism thinks the tree can be alive without ever bearing fruit. Legalism thinks that all that is necessary is to decorate the tree with green leaves and fresh apples to make it alive. The Bible presents a third alternative. Make the tree alive and it will bear fruit. The real gospel is that we are given a new birth, a new heart, a new record, and a new life in Jesus Christ. Mormons point to a spiritually dead sinner that is decorated with good works and insist that he is spiritually alive, but he is not. Jesus condemned the Pharisees. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Mormonism teaches you to say nice things about Jesus and to do nice things, but that doesn't make you a Christian. Your Jesus is your elder spirit brother, not your God. Your sins are mistakes of free agency, not the rebellions of a desperately wicked heart. You thank God for making you a righteous person, but you have never cried out for real mercy as an unworthy sinner. Jesus gives us a stark warning that many will go to the day of judgment confident that they are right with God, only to discover that their religion was a scam. It was meant not only to fool others, but even themselves. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Mormonism can never give real victory over sin because it doesn't offer this real Jesus and the gospel of God's free grace to sinners. The new birth Mormonism offers is only baptism with water, not with the real Holy Spirit. It may can generate great emotion, but it can only truly change the outside. The LDS Church can help drunks become sober and even get people tempted to homosexuality to act straight, but it cannot change the heart. It can never give real victory over sin. The fundamental answer to homosexuality is not simply heterosexuality but the real Jesus. The fundamental answer to porn is not internet blockers, but the real Jesus. This Jesus touched the unclean and made them clean. He is the one who offers us new hearts and the Holy Spirit who truly changes us. It's easy to dismiss your critics when many of them have no visible church, no call to holiness, and no accountability. But you can allow yourselves to lump all your critics in the same category. There are people who leave the LDS Church to find the Jesus who truly transforms them. Having been reconciled to God and having their hearts changed, they long to live lives pleasing to God. In the biblical gospel, God is not a means to our end of exalting ourselves. It is knowing Him that is to be our end. The focus of the Bible is Jesus Christ, as the mediator between God and man who brings us a perfect righteousness true holiness, and adoption as children of the one true and living God. The God beyond your wildest imagination offers you far more than ruling over a planet. He offers you true freedom and forgiveness and a heaven beyond your wildest dreams. He offers you a kingdom of righteousness and truth. He offers you himself. We cannot content ourselves with the polite religion of the Galatians or the Mormons. Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, 
For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. There is a radical nature to the gospel, but don't let that discourage you. The real God is far more holy than you have ever imagined, but he is also far more loving. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God does not allow us to play games with him, but he runs to meet us when we truly turn to him. Jesus described the prodigal son. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. We implore you to be reconciled to God. Go to him. Seek and you shall find. Knock, and the door will be opened. But seek him as he presents himself in his word, not as your false prophets have directed you. Unlike your general authorities who tell you to blindly follow them, we challenge you to take up the Bible and read it for yourselves. Discover Jesus for yourself in his word. Read the Bible as if knowing God is a matter of heaven and hell for you and your children, because it is. Over and over, your missionaries tell people to read James 1.5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. The biblical model for knowing truth is not to then close the scriptures, but to continue reading them. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. You may have had a burning in your bosom, leading you away from what God tells you in the Bible. But God warns, He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, but whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. It is the scriptures that are able to make us wise. Paul tells Timothy, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, throughly furnished unto all good works. Lucy Mack Smith described Joseph about the time of his 18th birthday. He expressed contempt for the Presbyterian pastors who had spent years studying the Bible. Joseph, from the first, utterly refused even to attend their meetings, saying, Mother, I do not wish to prevent you from going to the meeting or any of the rest of the family, or even your joining the church, if you please. But do not ask me to join them. I can take my Bible and go into the woods and learn more in two hours than you can learn at a meeting in two years, if you should attend all the time. Despite supposedly getting so much from the Bible, Lucy said Joseph Smith never bothered to read it very much. I presume our family presented an aspect as singular as any other that lived upon the face of the earth, 
all seated in a circle, father, mother, sons, daughters, and giving the most profound attention to a boy 18 years of age who had never read the Bible through in his life. He seemed much less inclined to the perusal of books than any of the rest of our children. Your scriptures say that Presbyterianism is not true. God bears you his testimony in the Bible that Mormonism is not true. It is a false church founded by a false prophet with a false gospel that is leading you to outer darkness. Our message is simple. We implore you to take up the Bible and read it for what it really says rather than what others have told you it says. You will find that many plain and precious things have been hidden by the false prophets of Mormonism. You will find that it is not just a few passages that present a different God and a different gospel, but the entire book. You will find the truth that will set you free. You will find a glorious Jesus who came to heal a broken world filled with broken people and to reconcile us to a holy God. You will find a grace that does cause your heart to fear, but also a grace that all your fears relieve. You will find a Jesus whose grace is truly amazing.